I cannot believe that we're already in the back half of 2024. Are you kidding me? But here we are. Before you know it, the calendar will be turning again. And that means we are already getting ready for 2025 conferences. And one that I'm personally very excited to attend again is the Insights EDU conference. If you care at all about growing enrollment and building a student-centered higher ed experience, you really should be at this conference. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. That's visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. Hey, everybody. This is Elvin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience. And today, we are extremely excited to announce our paid subscription service. By subscribing today, you will get exclusive early access to ad-free episodes, extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events, all while helping to sustain EdUp. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com and subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to edup on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. This is Dr. Joe Salustio back with you again and again and again. No, it will never end if you ever thought it would end. You were wrong. It will continue forever. In fact, I say this a lot, but my uh, uh, compadre and co-founder of the Edup Experience podcast, Alvin Freitas, this is, uh, what month are we in? August. I'm taking um, podcast recordings for December now, for December. That means I'm booked out every single day to podcast with you from now until December. So we're booking uh, far in advance. Got some great conferences coming up that we're going to be at. Um, for those that don't know, I've made a, tr- a recent transition. Uh, to uh, become the VP of Industry Engagement in Elucian, and I'll be uh, keynoting our Latin America Higher Education User Conference in Cartagena, Colombia. So I can't tell you how excited I am to go to Colombia. Uh, and then we're going to be at the Middle States Conference, um, uh, Middle States Commission on Higher Education in Philadelphia in early December. Great connections. Uh, so come find us. Uh, follow the content, if you will. Uh, we're going to continue to bring you amazing guests like my uh, guest that I uh, have on with you today. In fact, technically, this is his second time on the podcast. The first time we started recording with him, he was in an airport, I think, or a car, and the audio was so bad, it was just impossible. And I said, guest, I'm going to make sure I get you back. Just like I promised, right? And here he is. He's back with better internet connection today than he's had the last time. Uh, so we have a lot to catch up on. He is the one and only Dr. Randy Frisch. He is the president at the City University of Seattle. Randy, welcome back to an Up Microphone. Yep. How are you? Good, Joe. Thank you. I, I was at a funeral at the Naval Academy, um, oh. and that, that was the only thing that could have kept me from uh, uh, being a, a yeah, safer, way off. safer location. Yeah, way off. I I, I remember that. Um, and uh, you know, we it's been it's got to have been a year now almost since that happened, and that's probably because of me and my schedule, which is crazy. Uh, but a lot to catch up on. In fact, I think. When we were talking, you were the interim uh, president or chancellor for the National University System as they were going through the search. Obviously, they, uh, for those that don't know, then after that, I uh, interviewed Mark Milliron, Dr. Mark Milliron, who is now uh, the chancellor, I think, or the president of uh, National, and you're the president of City University of Seattle. So you've been moving around a little bit, haven't you? Yeah, Joe, uh, exactly right. Yeah. Um... Mark joined us a couple of years ago, and uh, uh, it's been a fantastic addition. So, and city, city, uh, uh, we are um, in Seattle, uh, as the name uh, portends. Uh, we've got about seven thousand uh, students. Uh, about half of them are uh, international students. So uh, we have some really uh, uh, beneficial uh, three plus one programs in Mexico, uh, China. Vietnam, uh, and some in uh, Europe as well. Uh, really, City University has some global reach. 
That's amazing. And um, uh, what I actually said this today, if you could believe it, I was talking to somebody here, Lucien, who used to work in international recruitment for an institution that she came from. And most people don't know, unless you're in the middle of it, how hard international recruitment is. And I'm not just talking about finding a student. I'm talking about CVS and F1s and J1s and OPTs and CPTs. I mean, it takes a lot of effort for an institution to invest in international recruitment and really reap the rewards of that, wouldn't you say? It is really hard. Uh, There are um, appropriate... uh controls and regulations on uh, international students studying in the United States, Uh, but they are complicated and, uh, and they have uh, restrictions that sometimes uh, keep us from uh, being able to provide a, a a robust uh, visit to uh, city university of Seattle. Um, That's why we have uh, developed more uh, cooperative programs for international students it's really expensive for uh, students to come to the U.S. to study. So what we've uh, worked hard to develop are partnerships with institutions that are in Mexico or Vietnam or China, where a student can study uh, three years in, uh, in their home country and then come to Seattle for the last year to earn a bachelor's. Uh, sometimes we do it two plus two. Uh, in our three plus one, we send faculty to the home institution uh, to uh, uh, teach uh, students uh, our courses, uh, and then they're prepared to come to uh, to Seattle. For our master's uh, level programs that we share, we do uh, quite a few one plus ones, uh, and that, that controls the expenses. It also ensures that students, when they come to Seattle, they have uh, a better experience. I like your style, dude. <laughs> I, uh... you. Uh, th- this this is a, a really important part of the conversation as we t- uh, as we enter or not even enter we're already a part of one of the more complex times in higher education right now we see FAFSA simplifications cause disruption we have um, regulatory confusion uh, particularly as we march toward an election where we are not sure which way that's going to go and and not to get political here because I'm not going to but. Each side has its own opinions on the higher education's place in the world and the regulations that should accompany that. Um, we see the value of a college degree become, you know, kind of coming into question. And it's those things you talked about, the one plus ones, the two plus twos, the partnerships within higher education that I think when we talk about revenue diversification, which we know is important for any institution, partnerships are foundational to that. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership ecosystem you have at the City University of Seattle and why it's so important to your success? Yeah, uh, just starting with domestic, uh, uh, with U.S. partnerships, uh, you know, City University was founded uh, in 1973, 51 years ago to help uh, students complete their education journey. Um there are 40 million uh, citizens of the United States who have some college, but not a degree to show for it. In the state of Washington, it's about 900,000, some Yikes. estimates of a million, who have some college, but not a degree to show for it. Uh, usually they've got debt, too. So that's not a, uh, uh, a good scenario for, uh, for either higher education or for the student. So... Um, we have partnerships working with community colleges, uh, regional community colleges. Um, in some cases, we share uh, facilities with them and, uh, uh, and then uh, work to make sure that there's a smooth path forward to a bachelor's degree in some of our programs from the community college uh, offerings. It's a, it's a very powerful uh, partnership, and it's an opportunity to help students complete in a, in a very efficient fashion really important to us. I was thinking the other day I was doing a LinkedIn post and I was talking about um, there was an article that came out how some institutions that are struggling right now are thinking that they're, they're going to move all their ground classes online. It's just the way they're going to start accessing the some college, no credential or no degree population, just going to go and do it. And I was posting about all the considerations that have to be made to do something like that with hours of operation and s- term structures and all the things that have to happen. And I'm glad to hear you bring up the some college, no credential population, because it's way more complicated than just getting people back into school. And one of the complications is debt. 
These people have attended college before. Many have left. They carry debt with them. Sometimes they're in financial aid default because they didn't pay back their loans. So there's a, um, I don't know, uh, technical bits that have to be overcome by universities to even serve this population. It's not like they're out there lining up at the door going, I want to come back, and institutions are failing to serve them. We're talking about working through individual situations with each individual in that 40 million because they all have complicated situations. It puts a lot of, of, I don't know, pressure on institutional operations to access that market. How have you done, how, what have you done successfully to bring more of those modern learners, adult students in a city? Yeah, it, uh, I think you described it uh, perfectly. It is uh, individual. Uh, every student, uh, potential student, prospective student has a little bit different institution or a, a situation. And, and depending on the institution they're considering, uh, the matrix uh, uh, lines up differently for them. We've, we've tried to invest more time uh, in uh, working with students uh, to uh, figure out the most efficient way for them to complete. City University was a pioneer in prior learning. We find frequently that um, whether it's governmental or military or uh, just a a regular industry trainings often uh, can uh, satisfy some of the learning objectives of courses. uh, And that's what's made uh, CityU successful. Um, We also work uh, with employers to try and uh, make sure that their employees get to skill up. Um, We've got uh, creative programs with uh, Amazon and with Boeing where we work with uh, them to develop curriculum that uh, produces the kind of skills that they need to step into jobs, uh, whether that's uh, their current position or whether that's a position they'd like to move to. With Amazon, you know, they've got a bunch of warehouse uh, employees, sometimes who are really talented. Well, they're all talented, but sometimes who want to move up. Uh, So we've crafted uh, certificates for help desk, for network engineers, uh, to try and move them uh, to uh, uh, let them improve their lives, let them improve their situation. So it's hard work, uh, but it's very satisfying to see uh, folks uh, who maybe were uh, on the assembly line at uh, Boeing and uh, were able to move up to a a supervisory position. Um, it's, It's been rewarding in that regard. Amazing. Uh, Randy, I love how nonchalant you are talking about the innovation that you have going on at CityU. And um, the reason I want to pick up from that is because there's universities that really um, would love to be able to talk about innovation so easily, but there's a lot of inertia, right? So prior learning assessment is one of those areas. It's very hard to come up with a PLA policy that serves a modern student when all the policies built around something like that are for an 18-year-old, you know, so you break policy structures by serving multiple um, uh, different types of students and accessing a modern learner. Then you talk about um, you know, transfer credit, you talk about these other areas uh, in the and you're you're talking about them nonchalantly and innovatively, as if it's just readily accepted that your institution is going to innovate to serve different student types. How have you gotten everybody there um, when you know that there's a lot of uh, change adoption problems in higher ed? Yeah, it it is uh, important to uh, engage faculty, um, and uh, we've got. Uh, a, a terrific uh, uh, registrar's office where uh, they are uh, experienced and skilled in working with program directors and faculty members to assess what sort of um, prior learning a prospective student might have that can uh, qualify for a course or two. It's really been uh, interesting to watch in uh, our School of Technology and Computing where uh, students, uh, you know, gosh, on their own are uh, developing programs, apps, uh, using AI in uh, innovative ways. And so our program directors and faculty are engaged in it and uh, work with our registrar's office and uh, come up with a way to get students through most efficiently. Outstanding. I love that. You come up with a way to get students through rather than preventing the student from from coming in because of a policy in the first place. That's just a mindset change, isn't it, from 
I would say certain structures of the past, and we'd say we're going to help as many people get through as possible. I cannot believe that we're already in the back half of 2024. Are you kidding me? But here we are. Before you know it, the calendar will be turning again, and that means we are already getting ready for 2025 conferences, and one that I'm personally very excited to attend again is the Insights EDU Conference. If you care at all about growing enrollment and building a student-centered higher ed experience, you really should be at this conference. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. That's visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. Hey, everybody. This is Ovin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience. Are you enjoying the conversation so far? Good. I hope so. Did you know that you can actually hear this conversation early before anybody else and ad free so you don't have to hear my voice during these ads? And did you also know that you could get extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content? That's right. Original content and invites to special events all while helping to sustain EdUp? Well, if you didn't know, now you know. So go to edupexperience.com that's e-d-u-p experience.com and become a subscriber today first you got to sign up to our free email newsletter and then you'll find out how to become a subscriber again go to edupexperience.com yeah it, it it's most uh rewarding inspiring to see faculty engage at the level uh, they are at city u to help students uh, complete um, you know, we have a high scholar practitioner component in our uh, faculty ranks, and, uh, you know, they, they see the need for many of these technology programs and, uh, and see how uh, we can move students uh, to, uh, forward faster, uh, help get them into industry. You know, what, one of the things that you and I talked about at the beginning before we started recording we were talking about business model innovation or business model transformation. You know, a typical, typically colleges and universities are tuition dependent. Um, and for the most part, those institutions have been readily disrupted by FAFSA simplification. And you're really indicating that you are kind of, uh, I don't know if immune is the right word, but at least you have a diminished disruption level from FAFSA because of the uh, how you serve students. Could you enlighten us on on that a little bit and uh, why that's such a differentiator for CityU? Yeah, well, at CityU, uh, only 30 to 35 percent of our students actually use Title IV. Um, I don't mean to uh, downplay the FAFSA rollout um, impact uh, because for those 35 student, 35 percent of the students. It was meaningful, and hopefully, we're in a better uh, position today. But uh, what we've uh, tried to do at City U is work with um, uh, corporations, businesses, Boeing, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon uh, in Seattle to uh, access uh, education benefits, um, and we've uh, we've been successful in getting. Uh, students uh, into programs that their employer uh, approves of for uh, education benefits. And, uh, and that's enabled us to reduce uh, uh, the uh, uh, debt burden uh, that, uh, that students leave with. Yeah, it's so, so good. Um, and it takes a different, also a different mindset and structure to do that. But I'll come, I want to come back to that later. Um, that'll be maybe an in-depth topic we'll go to for our, our subscribers. But I do want to talk about regulation a little bit. Um, you know, what, this is a, a funky, I'd say funky time in higher ed and uh, for the reasons I outlined earlier, political reasons and um, got a lot of things going on on campus. Uh, regulatory environment strange. There's some new Department of Ed regulatory frameworks that are coming um, in your direction as campus leaders. Um, can you just give us a high level assessment of some of the the regulatory changes on your radar and perhaps what you think about some of those things. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the department, uh, the education department is trying to uh, improve the student experience. We are trying to improve the student experience. And I think there needs to be more advocacy uh, on behalf of higher education uh, to try and uh, 
uh, partner with uh, with Ed and with state regulators uh, and programmatic regulators. Um, we've we've had a, a sort of um, adversarial relationship instead of a collaborative relationship with regulators, and that hasn't served students well. Uh, it has really put a burden on smaller institutions. Um, you know, regular uh, listeners of uh, this podcast have heard other uh, smaller institutions, presidents talk about the burden, the regulatory burden. And, uh, you know, having um, uh, staff to cover uh, like the fair value transparency rule, um, programmatic uh, creditor uh, staffing rules, uh, all the compliance rules that come from Ed and from the state, that adds staff. Uh, so when we uh, hear or read about how higher education has uh, administrative bloat, there's a reason for that. Uh, it isn't just uh, uh, because we like administrators. There are an incredible number of regulations that require really um, uh, detailed, uh, time-consuming uh, reporting, and uh, and that's driving up the cost of uh, education, which is not what the education department wants. It's not what regional accreditors want. It's not what programmatic accreditors want. You know, if you if you look at what the department uh, recently promulgated uh, in new rulemaking announcements uh, related to distance education, you know it's it's understandable why why is the education department doing that? Well, there's a lot of dissatisfaction over student debt. You know, the faculty are uh, uh, rightly concerned about their role in uh, the future of higher education, and then this. Um, uncertainty about the value of uh, higher education, it's all related to um, what we're trying to do individually rather than collaboratively. Um, You know, having distance education rules that limit innovation, limit an opportunity for us to educate students who are uh, full-time working or uh, who are uh, just trying to complete a degree after uh, getting a new position or military men and women, you know, a, a rule uh, that uh, limits our ability to offer asynchronous education as the proposed rule does, uh, doesn't help students. Uh, it hinders uh, our ability to innovate and meet them where they are. And if we were collaborating on these uh, regulations, these rules, I think we would serve uh, students, employers, uh, the country far better. Tell them like it is. I agree. And the the asynchronous piece of that is the one for me that makes the least amount of sense knowing that the complex lives of a modern student, um, you know, managing families, work, sometimes multiple jobs. You have rising inflation, the cost of goods. So dollars are, and cents are tight. Um, and, and you take all these things and, and you go, one thing we're going to take away is flexibility. I mean, that's what the modern learner really needs. If you're going to educate a student beyond the quote unquote traditional student, flexibility is one of the foundational reasons why that person is even able to go back to school. Right. I, I mean, so when you start to limit the flexibility, then the flexibility of online education, it takes away that value proposition. And, and for many, it will take away the ability to attend, don't you think? I, I do. And I think it uh, also ultimately drives up the cost of education. You know, it, where the department seems to be headed is, uh, you know, distance education is going to be either correspondence uh, or it's going to be uh distance education and thinking about where the department um, uh, opined on Western governors uh, a few years ago, uh, suggesting that uh, they were uh, correspondents. I I think what this rule is going to do is limit uh, an institution like Western governors uh, and ability to innovate. I, I do think we all want to make sure that students learn and that they get value out of education. And there, there are innovations out there right now in asynchronous uh, online learning that can provide the same sort of 
my friend Michelle Weiss uh, describes it as that that spark to finish, that insight into why this is important that faculty usually provide. Uh, I think the education department is worried that that's not in uh, uh, asynchronous learning. Um, that isn't in um, uh, correspondence courses. And, you know, if that's the case, let us innovate and uh, demonstrate that there is in uh, asynchronous learning opportunities for faculty to provide that spark, opportunity for faculty to provide that insight and inspiration uh, for a concept or a learning objective. Uh, those are the things that build trust in students and in families that higher education was valuable, is valuable. I did get a return on uh, on my investment in higher education. But uh, rule, unilateral rulemaking, either by ed or regional creditors or by programmatic creditors, that's not going to help us innovate. That's not going to help us get there. 100%. One of the big outstanding questions, I think, too, is how the Chevron uh, reversal is going to maybe depower Ed's ability to institute some of these um, uh, uh, regulatory items. You know, I think that's still fuzzy on on what, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, power, um, you know, uh, federal agencies are going to have for unil- unilateral rulemaking if it ends up going back state by state. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, I think there's a lot of opinion out there on how things are going to unravel, but I I do want to kind of come back to what you said. And I think it's an important point to make how, and we don't, this is not something that comes up often on a podcast in general. Um, For any that I've listened to, I've done over 900 myself and listened to a lot of other higher education podcasts. And it's, it's just, it's a concept that just doesn't come up that often. Regulatory, um, inserting regulatory requirements on institutions forces you to staff up because small institutions, uh, you know, 7,000 students right now, I don't even think that's small, but still 7,000 is, I'd say, midsize, a midsize institution and smaller. You barely have those human resources to do the job that you're doing to ensure that you're, con- you're controlling costs for the student. But then when you are forced to staff up just to meet regulatory requirements, it, it it then forces the business to turn around the onus and put it on the consumer for you know you end up passing on the cost to the consumer which we're all trying to prevent yeah i, I was listening to your podcast with president of uh, andrews uh, college and uh he, he he was talking about having to staff up to meet uh the fair value transparency uh, uh regulation and you know the concept of the fair value transparency of regulation uh, is something we all embrace. We want students Absolutely. to be able to get a great education. Um, I do think Chevron uh, is in the end going to be very helpful because it will, um, I, th- I hope, make all rules more collaborative than, uh, than dictatorial and yep. it uh, will give us the opportunity. Rulemaking does this as well. I do appreciate uh, the process, uh, but it will give us the opportunity to work with our regulators to uh, figure out what's really best for students. And, um, you know, I had a meeting with uh, uh, one of the assistant secretaries of education and, uh, you know, we left the meeting uh, very dedicated to helping students. How we get there, um, I, I think, is going to depend on how well in higher education we advocate for our position. I think we need to do a better job of uh, engaging the department, the regional accreditors and programmatic accreditors on the economic realities of uh, not only regulation, but of providing uh, students a a great experience, whether that's in an asynchronous or uh, uh, synchronous uh, or in person uh, or hybrid uh, model. Epic. Talk to uh, Randy as we kind of get toward the end of the uh, of the episode here. I do want to hear you tell us about some of the things on your radar right now at City U uh, as you look forward to the future. What do you have eyes on? Are you thinking competency based education? Are you messing with term schedules? Are you doing anything differently? 
um, subscription-based Title IV, three-year bachelor degree, anything out there that you're going, you know, artificial intelligence. I'm just giving, I'm putting words in your mouth a little bit, but what's what's um, on your radar? Yeah, I think, um, I, I guess you can't um, uh, over-discuss uh, on a topic, but artificial intelligence is certainly getting uh, its uh, fair share of, uh, of the uh, time artificial in discussion. Artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's uh, it is uh, something that I think uh, is going to move competency based education forward faster. I, I think the ability to assess um, uh, uh, learning objectives and what you really know uh, is already out there uh, in uh, artificial intelligence. So I think competency based uh, may um, may develop on its own through artificial intelligence. I'll give you one uh, one uh, thing we're doing at City that I th- think is uh, really exciting and fascinating. It's giving artificial intelligence is a terrific tool. And in our counseling programs in Canada, what we are doing is using artificial uh, intelligence, not only for our um, counseling uh, practice sessions, uh, developing a persona out of artificial intelligence, But then our uh, counseling students, when they're doing their practicum, their uh, experiential uh, 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 work in dealing with a client, counseling a client, then they uh, they will get an assessment off of uh, a uh, uh, artificial intelligence um, rubric. And the great thing about that is it frees up uh, the counseling uh, faculty to dig deeper into the issues, into that um, Michelle Weiss uh, spark or uh, insight that uh, really will provide a deeper, more meaningful um, education experience for students. And I think that's the promise of AI. It is a terrific tool. I think uh, we can embrace it and uh, use it uh, to uh, enhance uh, our kind of one-to-one uh, uh, experience, uh, student to faculty experience. I think it's going to be uh, fantastic. And we're looking at all the different ways that we can uh, use AI to, uh, to do that. I like that. I think you make a great point. Individualized learning. It used to be personalized, but it's individualized now. How can AI really individualize my journey based on where I am as a student? I think that's the... Pro, the great big hairy problem that that AI will help us solve is how personalized learning becomes a reality. Um, and and I think you make a great point. The of course the caution I always and you know this too for better than I do, but there are so many great programs out there with artificial intelligence. You want to grab them all up. Um, you figure out how they, you know, should I, should I have them embedded within my systems? Do I bolt them on? Um, how do I use them in my daily lives is something we all are finding our own journey with is how, how to use these programs. Yeah, it, it, it is, um, I think a tool that, uh, will, uh, maybe the first in several decades, a tool that will help us dig, uh, deeper, develop deeper, more meaningful, education relationships with students and uh, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Again, I think uh, the, the key will be uh, to work collaboratively to advocate for how we're going to use artificial intelligence with, with uh, the education department, with state regulators, uh, programmatic regulators, so that they can find uh, the level of comfort with, uh, with this new tool that, that I think ultimately uh, will prove to be. Well, there you have it, everybody. An amazing episode um, with my guest today. And we're going to ask him to come back um, and do a quick uh, mini episode for our subscribers. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been listening, this is a gentleman you want to follow doing great things out there in higher education. My guest today, no, he is your guest today. He's Dr. Randy Frisch. He is the president at the City University of Seattle. Randy, we hope we made this up to you after, after all this time finally getting you back. Joe, thank you. It's been great. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Higher education is evolving. And if you're in marketing and enrollment management, then you need to be at the Insights EDU conference. That's a fact. That's a fact. Insights EDU 2025 is happening February 12th through 14th. 
in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is your chance to explore the latest trends in higher education and discover new and innovative strategies to level up your program marketing and enrollment. Hear from some of the best speakers in the industry, from companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and more. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Hey, everybody. This is Elvin Freitas, co-founder of the Edup Experience. Did you enjoy that conversation? I hope you did. Did you know that you can actually hear this conversation early on and ad-free? And you can also hear extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events, all while helping to sustain EdUp. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't know, now you know. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com to subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, that's edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com.